Today, my wife and I are visiting Colonial Williamsburg, an amazing living history museum in Virginia that tells the early part of America's enduring story. Come along with me and my wife as we explore a history buff's paradise. That's coming up next. Seconds. Just check everything carefully and then leave it alone. So yeah. you don't have to clamp it or you know, yeah. it against the sure. steam. Yeah, because for one thing, with the clamping, the, the typical clamping uh, apparatuses that we have, um, although I suppose a builder who did these all the time so might just go ahead and make some kind of a flat rack and it might allow you to. So uh, guitar, guitar makers will sometimes do this, and the fact that you would have a, a, a larger board. Uh, you put your two, since the guitar tops are initially going to be two pieces mm -hmm. or a mirror image of themselves, yeah, you paint the glue, put it on, and then you can drive nails out here on the outer edges. Put a piece of wood or a clamp here on top so that that way they don't buckle. That's the reason why freehand clamping these things is going to be a problem because this is more apt to buckle than a fingerboard would do. So, uh, so then you have board, board, nails, clamp, and then bend the nails in. So that would provide just a little bit of pressure. You have to be careful because too much pressure in a joint can clamp. It squeezes too much glue out and now the joint is starved of adhesive. And it's just as likely to come apart on you as if you haven't been but so it, it hasn't been very good fact. So yeah, uh, you can overdo it with clamps oh. easily. Really, really easily. So um, if you really are having to use clamps and fitting something together and you really are having to force it together with the clamp, they don't fit good. You should go back to your tools and, and reshape it to fit. Uh, so yeah, because the clamps really should be serving to bring those services together with just a little bit of pressure and hold them in place so that the glue is going to be able to cool, gel, and, and bond all together. If I do my job right, though, and two of these boards glued up edge on edge, that seam should be stronger than the wood. Mm -hmm. yeah. now we, when know, we know the glues are that strong. Now, when you're fitting two boards, like the, for the sound boards, when you're fitting two boards of this thickness together, would they have been cut from the same uh, piece of lumber? Um, generally, well, for smaller stringed instruments like violin, viola, and cello, and in my background, guitar work, the answer would be yes. Mm -hmm. So that way, you'd actually have the two mirror, two mirror image. Mm -hmm. When we get into the harp supports, though, um, because you have so many pieces, the answer is uh, sometimes. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. I've seen some sound boards and seen descriptions of some sound boards, and the glue up was uh, it, it was all spruce, but there was no rhyme or reason mm -hmm. behind the glue up, and the sound board seemed to work fine. And how would you get it to be that that thin? Is it just ah uh, okay? Uh, the first thing would be the spruce would be purchased about this thickness, say about a quarter of an inch thick. 
a little thicker than this. Uh, cut, assemble, then with some of the, then I can set the profile into the already existing body, mark it out, and then with a saw like this, with a very thin, narrow blade, that's going to allow me to be able to cut out the curved side, and then the rest of it can all be cut with just a regular hand saw, mm -hmm. since all the other uh, edges are going to be straight. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that will solve that. Uh, the final thicknessing is done with uh, is done with bench planes, hand, hand planing. Mm -hmm. So generally, in my practice, I will make sure the bench is clean. Uh, I know some builders they have an in their shops they have an absolute dedicated bench for making soundboards, and that is the only thing that occurs on that bench. So it's clean. You know it's a true flat surface. Flatter, flatter surface. Keep checking that uh, clamp. Uh, usually, what I will do is that the surface that is ultimately going to show the upside, I will clean up first, and then it's turned over, and then you do the final thicknessing on the underside. If you see the undersides of some of these soundboards, they look a lot like guitars because they've got ribs, strips of wood that have been glued to them. If you've ever seen the inside of a class guitar or an acoustic guitar, not just this thin piece of wood. Mm -hmm. It does need some strengthening mm -hmm. and a little bit of resilience because otherwise it will collapse for sure mm -hmm. under all that tension, right. under all that stress. Mm -hmm. yeah. So during the 18th century, was creating musical instruments considered its own separate specialty from just general carpentry? Or was musical instruments more of like a specialty of the greater whole of cabinet? Cabinetry okay. here um, and, and woodworking. Yeah, musical instrument work uh, at the highest level would be yeah. a line of work on wood itself, totally unrelated to anything else. It could also break down into subspecialities where you're primarily a maker, um, like Melanie, my apprentice over here, uh, violin, viola, cello, both stringed instruments. Guitar making, the making of mandolins and plucked stringed instruments can be a completely different category. You'll find some builders, well, Antonio Stradivari great playing violin mm -hmm. primarily boat instruments, but we know he made guitars and mandolins, the records for them, and a couple of them do survive. So it, it does occur. So um, what was happening here is a little vague. We've got a cabinet shop that was set up here, ran for a number of years, a new master took it over, advertised in the Virginia Gazette that the cabinet making will continue in this business just as before. And then at the bottom of the ad is a little note bene. Oh yes, spinets and harpsichords made and repaired. Extra service. Since we don't know the background of that man in England, he does mention in another ad that he was from London. We're not quite sure where this is coming from. Possibly in London, he was trained as a cabinet maker. He might have gotten pulled into making organs. Because chamber organs and chapel organs have these beautiful cases, you know, cabinet work fits right in. And it's really easy to get pulled into all that mechanical work from organs. And organs are mostly mechanical issues. Not quite the same situation as what we're dealing with. Uh, these instruments with vibrating soundboards and uh, these bodies. So that might explain it, but we can't prove it. He shows up here in 1765. He's working here in the area, takes over this business in 67, offers harpsichord work along with cabinet making. Stays here about three years, moves to the other side of Williamsburg where he stays for the rest of his days. And uh, in the period right after the revolution, we have some receipts where he did fix up a small spinet and he unpacked and did the setup for an imported instrument. So there was something to this. So but had, exactly, so had the skills for the musical instrument. There seems to be a skill set there. Yeah, it's just that we don't know where it came from, how much of a role that it played. What we have done is to take everything that I just told you about history and use it as the chance, excuse, <laughs> whatever you want to call it, to go ahead and have a dedicated trade here. So for us here at the corner, parts of courts are it. That's what we do, study, research, um, practice. And then we've got three cabinet makers who are shortly focused on fine chair work, cabinet work, casing, beds, carving work. Whereas, particularly for us in part support work, the decorations more often tend to be veneer. 
so thin skins of wood that are sawn out thin, you know, thinner than this, than you've been using for the soundboards. And then these can be cut and assembled into all sorts of patterns. By doing this, we can still build the proper structure for the harpsichord, or perhaps for a cabinet. But then with this technique of decorating with thin pieces of wood on the outside, we can make it look any way you want. Because that's not inter that has no role to play in terms of the engineering of the piece. That's just purely decoration. Well, that's a wrap for this Colonial Williamsburg video. I hope you really enjoyed it. Again, to see another part of this amazing Living History Museum. If you like this sort of stuff, check out my other videos. Check out colonialwilliamsburg.org to plan your own visit here because it's so much co cooler in real life than it is on film. Till next time, this is History Buff, TN Photobug signing out, and I'm having a blast with the past.